Welcome to Celebration. Thank you for joining us once again. We have a good start on the new year now. We're uh, three Sundays into it, so if you haven't seen our previous two messages for 2023, you need to check those out because we're in a series. I've called it Resolution Revolution. I want to revolutionize the way we think about making New Year's resolutions. Most of us say we don't even make them anymore. I contend that we really do because the resolution is nothing nothing more than just a goal and a plan. And so uh, I'm planning on having a vacation this year, so uh, that's a resolution. I'm going to do what it takes to go on one. Uh, we just don't call it that. We make our plans. We have our dreams, our aspirations. Uh, those are really just resolutions. Uh, but I want to revolutionize that with you and with me and challenge us to uh, make them spiritual, make them deeper, and do what it takes to fulfill them. Because if they are spiritual, then they've got to be important. And that's kind of revolutionary thinking. We tend to just think of some things that aren't a big deal if I don't really follow through. And so that's why we don't make them much. We say, well, man, I quit all of them by February. Well, that must not have been a very important resolution. The ones I'm suggesting as we do this series uh, can really make a difference in eternity as well as all of our life here. So we've got two that we've already done, and now we're on a third. So I hope you've been with us, or we'll pick up on those. All of them begin with the letter S, and they're just little short, punchy little titles. So we did stop that. Some things you can't get started new till you stop doing some of the old. So look at that first one. That was January 1st, actually. And then last week, we did start up some of the things we ought to be doing. You might find that you're doing some of those, but maybe you need to do it more often. Maybe you need to do it more intensively. Uh, so start doing some of those things. And today's, we're going to see how it really all comes together and, and happens because I want to challenge us to surrender fully. Uh, that'll make a great year if we can do that. Uh, we surrendered to Christ. If you indeed are a true born-again Christian, then you had to surrender to Jesus Christ. The problem is we retain our old nature, and sometimes uh, we just kind of take back over the throne of our own life, and that's just not right. It's not what God has intended. Uh, he allows it, uh, obviously, because here we are, and sometimes we put ourselves in charge. Uh, I think the problem is the word surrender. Uh, we don't like that as Americans, that's for sure. Uh, we've been independent people all our lives, and we just want to be that way, and that's not good with Christ. We shouldn't be independent. Uh, secondly, I think we get the idea that we can compartmentalize our lives and that I could surrender uh, spiritually, but I don't have to surrender physically. I, I could surrender uh, to a certain extent. Those are compromises, not surrender. So that's why the word fully, surrender fully. And we're going to look at some verses that give us the, the whole uh, background for this, the whole basis, I should say, for uh, the idea that we don't belong to ourselves anymore and we're not supposed to be in charge. And then we'll break it down a, a little bit more and look at some of the ways that we need to be fully surrendered. So let's start with just setting a basis for, see what Jesus said, what James said, what Paul said. Uh, of course, all of that means the Holy Spirit said it, and that's why it's in our Bible. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 9, first of all, see what Jesus said about this idea of uh, whose we are. Not just who we are, but whose we are. And we don't belong to ourselves. Listen to what he said in Luke 9, 23. He said to them all, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. For what does it benefit someone if he gains the whole world and yet loses or forfeits himself? So he's clearly saying, you've got to get rid of self here. Deny yourself, give up your life, and you'll find something even better in Christ. Now James talks about it a little bit differently in James chapter 4, we're going to visit a couple verses here now and come back to it later for another point. But James 4, uh, verse 4, he says, Don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? So whoever wants to be the friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. You see, you can't have it both ways. You, you can't compartmentalize and say, well, I will surrender spiritual things to God, of course. But my physical stuff, that's, that's for me, right? No, wrong. You can't Walk in both worlds and do it correctly. If you drop down to verse 7, 
He says, because of that, therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Surrender. Give yourself up to God and his plans for you. We'll talk more about that. But give yourself up to God. Fully surrender. The devil won't be able to stand that, and he'll flee from you, and you can begin to live out this life of surrender. Now, Paul got it right down to the nitty-gritty here in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, and says, here's what it really amounts to. If you're going to talk about surrendering fully, listen to what Paul says. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul's explaining it as a, as a death, not physically, obviously, because he goes on to say, the life that I now live in the body, so obviously I'm still alive, but he has crucified the old Paul, the Saul, if you will, back in the New Testament. That's been crucified with Christ. When I accepted Christ as my Savior, I died to self and sin. You say, well, wait a minute. Are you saying you've been perfect ever since? No, because I tend to resurrect that part. I tend to feed that life, uh, and we're supposed to go the other way with it. That's why the fully surrender part. That's why I need to make the, the commitment. I need to see myself as crucified so that I might live this new life that's fully surrendered to Jesus. So we need to surrender our whole life, not try to put it into sections and say, well, I can give Christ this, I'll give God this part of my life, but i I got to do this for me and mine. No, you don't. We need to surrender our total self to God. But let me break that down into four areas of life that we need to surrender. And then on the last one, I'll get real practical. So if you want to surrender fully, start with your perspective about life. Uh, we need to see things differently than the average person does. That's possible because when you accept Christ as your Savior... Uh, the Holy Spirit of God comes in your life. And so you can see with new eyes. You can feel with a new heart. You should, and actually even must, begin to take on the attitude and, and nature of Christ. Uh, we've talked about this all along and, and very often because that's what real Christianity is. It's a relationship with Christ, whereas we realize who He is and allow His Spirit in us to help us be more like Him. Walk with me a little bit here through Philippians. Uh, this is a great little book, and you ought to just read the whole thing. And I don't mean just read through it, but think about what he's saying as you go through there. Uh, I'm just going to highlight a verse in or two in each chapter to kind of give a summary from this perspective of having the right kind of perspective. I need to think differently. We talked about it last week in Romans chapter 12 to have our mind transformed as God makes us new. The same thing here all the way through the book of Philippians. In chapter 1, verse 27, he tells us, As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. As citizens of heaven, that's a whole different perspective. Uh, we hear so much about our rights and our freedoms as Americans, and we get so caught up in our civil rights and our economic rights and political rights and whatever else you want to look at. And the truth of the matter is that's about third on the list as being a citizen of the United States. The first one's going to be as a citizen of heaven, uh, not the future heaven. That's a part of it. But I'm already a citizen of heaven. I just haven't moved there yet. But when I became a part of the family of God, and as a citizen of heaven, I'm supposed to live differently than those who are just citizens of the world. Now, my family also comes first. Uh, second, I should say, Christ comes first. Uh, so I, I move this citizenship of our earthly kingdoms on down the line a little bit. Be the best citizen you can be, but that's only going to happen if you'll be the best citizen of heaven you can be. A whole different perspective. We live for him and his purposes. In chapter 2, he explains it with verse 5, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Perspective, get the mindset of Christ. And then he went on to explain, won't read the verses, but just summarize them for you, that Jesus lowered himself to become human, 
took on mankind, took on flesh and became a man. But he lowered himself more and became a servant among men. And even further, he sacrificed himself for mankind. And you and I are supposed to have that kind of attitude. Now that's revolutionary. That's a different kind of perspective than what we hear all the time. Uh, we've been brought up to believe that we can be all that we can be. That's not really biblical. I need to be all Jesus wants me to be. And I can do that only through Christ. But the attitude has to be that I belong to him, that I've been crucified. The old self is gone. I've been made new through the spirit of Christ, and I need to live that out with his mindset, his morality, his character. Verse 3, as we go on through Philippians, or chapter 3, I'm sorry, uh, verse 7. Paul had just uh, enumerated some of the blessings, I guess you could call them, some of the uh, abilities, some of the uh, opportunities that he had had from his birth, uh, through his upbringing, some of the things he had accomplished, and then went on to say in verse 7, but everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. What a revolutionary thought for this world. That all the stuff the world keeps telling us to get, to go after, to grab all the gusto we can in life, to uh, step on whoever you need to to climb up the ladder and, and make the most of yourself and all of that, all of that is contrary to our real purpose in life. And that's surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And Paul said, that's my new perspective. I used to be that way. I gave my life to Christ, and now he's everything to me. And everything else fails to appeal. Everything else fails to work. It's all about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 4, he tells us how we can work on that and what our mindset should be leaning toward and tells us even really the kinds of things to think about. Verse 4. 8 of chapter 4, he says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there's anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Wouldn't that be revolutionary if we would be resolved to think about the good stuff? We clamor for gossip. Uh, we want to get on social media and get the dirt on somebody or see what's up. We go to the news to hear negativity, and there's plenty of it on the news. Why don't we want to talk about things that are honorable and true and just and pure? That's that old nature rising up. We need to be crucified. We need to lay it on the altar. Get a whole new perspective. Surrender your perspective to God. Get a mindset like Christ. Get a worldview that's biblical. You realize out of 7 billion people in the world, 6.5 billion probably, uh, certainly 6 billion, but I'm going to say most of Christianity, does not have a biblical worldview. We have a worldly worldview. We think about it from man's perspective. We think about it the way we want things instead of seeing the world how God sees it. Instead of seeing our own lives how God sees it. He said, I made you and I made you for my purposes and pleasure. And we don't even want to go there. And that starts it all. Surrender your perspective. And when you do, then you'll need to surrender your purpose. That's the second area. Surrender your purpose. Realize that if, if I exist for him, then I need to see what he's up to and be a part of that. What's God's purpose for me? A summary in Colossians 1.10. In the first few verses, Paul's telling the church at Colossae that I, ever since I've heard of your faith and ever since I've been a part of your spiritual life, I've been praying for you. And here's why in verse 10. So that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. There's your purpose in life, to be fully pleasing to God in the way that you live, the way that you walk. I could never be worthy of the Lord, but my lifestyle needs to go that direction that we would realize that God deserves and demands that we live better lives than most of us are, certainly more spiritual, fully pleasing to him. And that's going to produce works that means we bear fruit. 
And we're going to grow in the knowledge of him. We're going to get to know him better and better and better as we serve him and live for him a life that's pleasing to him. That's your purpose. You might be thinking, well, no, I'm a doctor or I'm a nurse. My, my purpose in life is uh, healing and to help people uh, physically to, to be the best they can be. No, it's not. Not biblically, that's not your purpose. Your purpose is to please the Father through your medicine, if you're that. If that's your calling in life, so to speak, if that's the thing that kind of drives you, then you find ways to please God by doing that. Because your purpose in life is to please Him, not yourself. Not to please others and help them. You help them because it pleases the Father. If you're an educator and you say, no, my purpose is to educate people and to help them learn and, and they might grow and, and be better citizens and do a better job at life because I've helped to educate them. It's not your purpose. That's the way you fulfill your purpose because you live life differently than I do. He made us different. We've got a whole series on purpose, on pleasing God. Go back and watch it from last fall and you'll realize that God has made you special so that you can please him in special ways. So whether it's in the medical profession, the education field, the economics, the accounting, the administration, uh, coaching, playing ball, uh, he's given you all kinds of abilities and a certain character and opportunities, not so that you can excel in those fields or just make life out of that, but that you can use those things to fully please him. And those good works that you do in those fields with that character you've got, with those abilities you've got, will bear fruit as you grow in the knowledge of God. So surrender your purpose. Quit living for you. Quit living for the world. He says, live for God. The life that I now live, I live in Him because I've been crucified, Paul said. So you surrender your perspective. That'll give you a new purpose. You surrender that purpose and take on God's purpose. Who do you want me to be, God? What do you want me to do, God? Because I'm supposed to live for you. I want to please you. When you figure that out and commit to that and be resolved to do that, first of all, that's revolutionary, but it's right and good. Well, now I've got to figure out how to do that, and I need some plans. Surrender your plans. Jesus in the garden, I think, is probably the ultimate statement. He went into the garden to pray the night that he was going to be betrayed, and he said, Lord, Father, if you could take this cup from me, do that, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours. Can we say that about our plans? Can we say, not my will, but yours? I said we'd come back to James 4. Here we are back at it in verse 13 and following. He also had something to say about making plans. Not just flee the devil and draw close to God, but when you do that, that ought to change your plans. So look at verse 13 of James 4. He says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow... We will travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. For you are like vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes. Instead, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. What James is saying here is we don't have the ability to see into the future and to control the future, so how can we really make the right plans? Well, only if we have help from the future. God sees it all. He's already seen the end of things. He's God from the beginning to the end and all in between, and he had no beginning himself. So he knows what's going on tomorrow, and he knows what's best for you, and he's called you to live according to his plans and purposes. So if you and I would strive to make our plans according to his will, it's going to work out. In fact, I'm convinced, though I may not be very good at putting it into practice, that instead of making plans and then asking God to bless them, if we would just get it right up front and, and make our plans according to His, we wouldn't even have to ask Him to bless it. <laughs> We're already doing His plans His way. He's got to bless that. You say, well, how could I possibly know that? Mostly get into the Word. Uh, we also need to bathe it all in prayer, but prayer has to always be judged by the Bible. God's not going to tell me something that's contrary to his Bible and say, yeah, go do that uh, and do it any way you want. We're going to have to operate according to his word. So spend time with God, getting to know him. We've already read that in the verses, that we might 
grow in the knowledge of Him. As we spend time with Him, we're going to begin to see what kind of plans He would have for us and how He would like for us to live and what He wants us to do. He's not going to give us all scheduled out for the next several years, but we can know more often what direction to go in and where to take today and maybe tomorrow. I'm not saying you can't make some plans for the future. I'm saying consult God first. That's what James said. And pray about it. Make sure it's biblical. Make sure it's scriptural. And then watch him open the doors and close the doors that guide us in the right paths. Surrender your plans to God. Surrender that perspective. Start thinking about life the way he wants you to. Develop his purpose into your plans by surrendering all of your goals and dreams and purposes. Make the plans according to his word and according to what he's got in mind. And then it comes down to practice. As I said earlier, when we get to this fourth one, I'm going to get a little more specific in it. But the point is, once I've got the plans that I really believe are God's plans for me, I still could mess it up by taking over again, by taking charge and say, here's the way we're going to do that. God wants us to witness, so here's the only way to do it. God wants us to build a church. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, God wants me to build my life in Christ. Oh, here's what I want. See, if it's me, 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 I, 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 I've messed up. In the practice of these plans, it's still got to be about God. I've still got to be surrendered even in my daily practice. I love these verses in Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways know him or acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. In all your ways that's the practice of my plans. I've got to trust in the Lord with all my heart to make my plans and realize that I can't do them on my own. I don't understand the future, and I don't understand how people are going to react, and I don't even know my own heart sometimes. So I've got to trust it all to God. But in every one of my ways, in everything that I then put into practice, it's got to be His way. It makes sense. If you surrendered your life to him in order to get saved, why would you take it back and take back control and mess it all up? <laughs> we need to live our life in faith as well and let him straighten our paths up and take us in the right way. Quickly, I want to share three areas, I think, of our daily practices uh, that need to be surrendered. And chances are we struggle with all of them. Now, these are just general and you can fill in the blanks. But first of all, surrender your time. Spend more time with God. We talked about it last week. Time alone with God and then time together with God's people. Surrender our time. So much of the time. I say it, you say it, I hear it all the time. Oh, I don't have time for that. I don't have time. Now others will say, I don't even have time for church. I've heard so many people say, you know, I work five days a week or six. And then on Saturday, I've got to do all the things around the house I couldn't do because I worked all week long. So Sunday's the only day I've got to, for myself. Let me suggest this. If you're a Christian, you not only don't have time to do those things, you don't have time, period. It's not your time. <laughs> it's God's time. You might make all the plans you want and begin to put them into practice, and you're not even going to show up. You read a parable about the rich farmer that Jesus talked about. He made all these big plans and started investing all of his money and efforts into making plans. And God says, you fool, your soul's required of you tonight. Do you really think that you're guaranteed tomorrow or next year? You don't know what kind of time you've got. That's why the Bible says, make the most of every opportunity while the time is here. Work while the day is here, the night comes when we won't be able to work anymore. And that's going to come suddenly. We have no clue about tomorrow. We better spend our time wisely with God. Surrender your time to God. Make sure you've got time for the Word. Make sure you've got time for prayer. Make sure you have time to worship with others. Make sure you have time to live your life for the Lord. Because time's in His hands, not yours. Second area would be in our talents. We need to surrender our talents to God. They're His anyway. He made you. Made you for His purposes. Again, you could go back and, and see more of this in last fall's uh, messages on pleasing God. 
One of the major areas we had a whole message on were our abilities. And then spiritual gifts, more spiritual talents. And they're all given to you, not so you can enjoy life the way you want to, not so you can live out your life however you please, not so you can make a fortune, not so that you can just satisfy your own desires. You're given these things so that you might serve God more fully. You might be able to use these talents. Can you uh, speak? (laughs) Then use your speaking to testify about Jesus, to teach others about the Bible. Maybe be a preacher, I don't know, be a Sunday school teacher. Just share one-on-one with people. Can you sing? Then sing for the Lord. Can you play an instrument? Play an instrument for the Lord. Are you good at organizing and administration? Uh, Did God make you a little more intelligent than some of the rest of us and so you could figure out some things and you could uh, uh, help us to to organize and run some things? Uh, There's just all kinds of abilities and talents. Are you an athlete? A coach? Uh, Coach people for Jesus. Get involved in people's lives with your talents to serve the Lord because that's why you exist. It's for His pleasure, remember? You need to surrender your talents and abilities. They weren't meant for you. They weren't meant for this world. They're meant to help you please God in a special way that nobody else can because I don't have your talent. You don't have mine. So I need to surrender mine. You need to surrender yours. And we both surrender to God. Time, talents, and finally treasures. Maybe this one hurts the most because that includes my money, includes my salary, includes my savings, includes my prospects, my treasures, the things that we value, our house, our car, things we've worked hard to get and spent money on. But they're not ours. First of all, the Bible says the tithe belongs to the Lord. Ten percent is supposed to go right to God anyway, right off the top, goes into the ministry, take it into the church. The Bible in the Old Testament talks about bringing it into the storehouse. Bring it into the church that you attend and worship and serve in and bring it in there so that together our monies can help us do a lot more things and take care of a lot more people and do ministry. But you're also responsible for the other 80, 85, 90 percent, depending on what you're not giving into the church. So you're not off the hook by tithing and say, well, I gave my portion to the church. No, all of it belongs to God. It's his money. It's his physicality and mentality that he blessed you with that you could even make some money and he deserves that we live that life to him we just read it a while ago paul said that that you walk worthy of this calling that you walk worthy of the lord that's also got to be in the treasures jesus had more to say about money than he did about hell it's important because he also said in the sermon on the mount where a man's treasure is or where his heart is, there's his treasure. That's how you feel about it. If that's what I value, that's my treasure. That's where my heart is. But if that's not God, something's wrong. We exist to please him. He gave us the abilities to make some money. That money needs to please him. Those abilities need to please him. Surrender fully. Get the right perspective. Surrender that to God. Get his mindset, his viewpoints. That'll tell you what your purpose in life is, and that's to please him, but you'll get it with the right perspective, and you'll realize I exist for his pleasure and his purposes. How can I do that? I surrender my plans and let him decide how I'm going to do it and when I'm going to do it and where I'm going to do it and give the plans up to him. And then as I put into practice those plans, I surrender my time, my talents, and my treasures Because my perspective's telling me they're all his anyway. Just give them up. He'll bless you. He'll work through you. He will change lives because of you. Give it up to God. Let's make a resolution that we're going to be his and just give ourselves surrender to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have offered this kind of relationship to us, to anyone who would just realize who you are and why you have us here. You made us for a relationship with you. Let us, help us, just surrender to that and then find out the details and and work them out as we live a life fully surrendered to you. It's the best for all of us. Help us do it, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.